Kicking off at number 5, The Lost Roman Legion. A mystery that has baffled Roman historians for eons. The Legio 9 Hispania or the 9th Legion, also commonly known as the Lost Legion, was one of the most renowned fighting forces of the Roman Empire that existed from the 1st century BC until at least 120 AD. They collected countless battles and victories across the empire's influence, participating in the Siege of Asculum in 90 BC, as well as fighting ferociously beside Mark Antony in the Battle of Actium. Following the assassination of Caesar, they were one of the Senate's most powerful military tools and battled the Cantabrians of Spain as well as the Germanic tribes of the Rhine borderlands. And after that, their successes led them to Britain, where they participated in the Roman invasion led by Emperor Claudius. And it is thought that they were stationed there all the way until 120 AD. And then they disappeared completely, seemingly fell off the face of the earth. Now the Romans were incredibly diligent record keepers, it's why we know so much about them and why they made extensive records of every military battle and confrontation, even their losses so they could better develop their imperial machine. And the 9th legion after seemingly heading to Scotland to fight the Picts and Celtic tribes just disappeared. No notes, no records, nothing. Now the lost legion was made up of over 5,000 men and somehow in the strange mists of time they all completely disappeared. I guess we'll never know. Coming in at number 4, the Sky Caves of Nepal. Also known as the Mustang Caves, the Sky Caves of Nepal are a collection of over 10,000 man-made caves dug deep into the sides of the Himalayan Valley in the Mustang district of Nepal. This place has absolutely baffled archaeologists and researchers since their discovery in the mid-90s when local explorers began venturing inside the stack caves and found several dozen partially mummified human bodies, all at least between 2,000 and 3,000 years old. Further exploration of these caves has led to discoveries of valuable Buddhist paintings, sculptures, manuscripts and numerous ancient artefacts that is thought to belong to the 12th and 14th century. But the fact that the sky caves seem to predate them by over at the least 2000 years has offered no answer to the burning question. Who built these caves and why? Since 1996 the Sky Caves of Nepal have been listed as a UNESCO tentative site and the Mustang region was formerly known as the Kingdom of Lo until its annexation by Nepal at the end of the 18th century. This in turn made it a restricted this in turn made it a restricted demilitarized area until 1992 making it one of the most preserved and isolated regions on the planet. Seemingly whoever was making these caves have been there for at least 3000 years burying their dead in elaborate ritualistic ceremonies sky tombs and no one has any idea why. At number 3, A858. This made its way onto the internet in 2011 and it's one of Reddit's most puzzling subreddits. So basically this page is dedicated to long and confusing codes that are written in a hexadecimal. This numerical notation system is used in computer programs. So many people have tried to solve these codes, even teaming up with others to try and figure them out. The A858 used to post daily, and very few of their posts have actually been deciphered. But when someone does manage to crack the code, it's usually a random phrase or something else pretty trivial that's being revealed. The meanings of these codes and their purposes in the first place is still a mystery to this day. Maybe the answer lies in one of the uncrackable codes. Coming in at number 2, the Plague Doctor video. So yeah, this video is very strange and altogether creepy. It first appeared online in May of 2015. Basically the video is of this person in a plague doctor's mask and they are doing some strange movements in an abandoned building. There's some morse code going on, an odd static tone and some jump cuts of other videos spliced in. The whole point of this video is unclear but it's creepy nonetheless. This video is titled 01101010101010101 etc. Yeah, it goes on for a while. This binary code translates to Muert, which in Spanish means death. Of course there is a thread devoted to figuring out exactly what's going on in this video. And they reveal that the video apparently contains the coordinates to the White House, some chess moves, disturbing images depicting violence against women, and other random threatening messages. The source of this video is unknown as the posters claim no connection to the video and maintain that they did not create the video. So yeah, no one knows the point of this video, but nonetheless it's pretty creepy. Alright and before we jump into our number one spot, I just want to remind you guys to please show us some love by giving this video a big thumbs up and subscribe subscribing to our channel. And once again stay tuned until the end of the video as I will be answering your questions. And if you would like to be featured in an upcoming video then make sure you leave those questions below. And in at number 1, Anonymous. Yes, this is definitely one that needed to be on this list. We've all heard about this group, but if for some reason you are unfamiliar with them, Anonymous was founded in 2003 and it's a group made up of self-proclaimed hacktivists who have basically become a household name over the
over the past several years. This group's goal is to online and attack governments, government institutions, government agencies, corporations, and the Church of Scientology. The people of this group say that they have a greater good purpose behind their attacks. Most of their attacks took place in 2011 and 2015. They will usually flood websites forcing them to shut down. The group is also skilled when it comes to finding something their target is sensitive about and using that to their advantage. They recently declared war on ISIS, they flooded its associated websites with porn and shut down many pages for good. What's even crazier is the anonymous members have been able to keep their identities a secret even after all of these years. The police and government have tried to find out who the members of this group are since they first came out and still 15 years later they have no idea. In the number 5 spot we have the Mary Celeste. The Mary Celeste was a boat 103 feet in length that weighed 280 tons. It was crafted in Nova Scotia back in 1860. Her final voyage was under Captain Benjamin Briggs, a 37 year old veteran and the ship set sail on the 7th of November in 1872. On board it was the captain, his wife, his young daughter, a crew of 8 and they had a whole lot of alcohol they were bringing to Italy. Unexplained disaster struck midway through the voyage and the ship was found floating at sea with no one on board. The ship was still in working order, no clue was left of what happened to the captain, his family or his crew. There was no sign of a struggle, everything remained intact on the boat, the only thing missing was the captain's luck. I don't know, if you had to ask me, they probably cracked into that alcohol, had a bit of a party, ooh I'm going to the water, wait there's no one left on the boat, but um, yeah. No one knows what happened to them. In the number 4 spot we have the Bermuda Triangle. This is the expanse of water between Florida, San Juan and Bermuda. It's connecting coordinates from the infamous zone of mystery. For the longest time now, planes and boats, anything going in this area, well they kind of tend to like just vanish in weird circumstances. The first unexplained event happened on December 5th, 1945 when Flight 19, a squadron of 5 US Navy torpedo bombers vanished into thin air during a routine training exercise. Now, Previous to takeoff, the planes had been thoroughly investigated and checked to make sure they were in flying order. Also, it was during a time of peace, so it's really unlikely that they got shot down. A search and rescue aircraft with 13 men on board was dispatched to locate the missing planes, but that aircraft too and its passengers also went missing. In the last century, over 50 ships and 20 planes and all on board have disappeared in this triangle. So Bermuda. Yeah, not going there for a holiday. Swinging in at number three, the Ridgeway Hill Viking Burial Pit. And this one is so heavy metal that I have no idea. It could literally make up the plot of a Clive Barker film. In September 2008, archaeologists from Oxford Archaeology began excavating along the route of the A354 when they discovered a burial pit on nearby Ridgeway Hill containing the bodies of what appeared to be 54 Viking mercenaries. And all of them were decapitated. Not only were they all decapitated though, but when their remains were discovered, it was found that they were all in relatively neat little piles. Their heads in one pile, their torsos in another, like some kind of ancient hunting grounds visitor attraction. Researchers are stumped about the Ridgeway Hill pit, there are no leading theories and the vast majority of it just doesn't make sense. Carbon dating found that their remains dated back to between 970 and 1025 AD and they were all of Scandinavian origin and carried the physiques of warriors. One leading theory is that the group were somehow ambushed by nearby villagers and ceremoniously slaughtered, but that makes zero sense and has no ties to the known ritualistic practices of the native Britons. Also markings on the Vikings bones show that the method of execution was a bizarre mix of crude and incredibly precise blows and there was a total of 188 wounds visible on the skeletons, an average of 4 per Viking one of which had the top of his skull sliced off, exposing his brain. Vampiric blood ritual, ancient cult sacrifice, I have no idea, but the Ridgeway Hill Pit doesn't make any sense at all. Next up at number two, Gobekli Tepe. And to be honest, I could talk about Gobekli Tepe all day because what the hell is going down in that place, we'll maybe never know. Gobekli Tepe, which is Turkish for Potbelly Hill, is an ancient megalithic site that was evidently used for social ritualistic practices. Oh, and also, it dates back to the 10th millennium BC at the least. Just look at this place and you'll understand exactly why this is so insanely baffling. During a time which most anthropologists agree we as humans were primitive hunter gatherers. 
but nah, Gobekli Tepe seems to say otherwise. With the structure itself making up patterns of absolutely massive T-shaped stone pillars, more than 200 of them which form around 20 separate circles and are currently the world's oldest known megaliths, older than Stonehenge. Do you know the kind of ingenuity it takes to build a structure like that? So during a time when mankind was seemingly roaming the plains hunting mammoths, we were actually building incomprehensibly vast structures. Klaus Schmidt, who was a leading German archaeologist, held the belief that Gebekli Tepe was a vastly important pilgrimage destination and a somewhat cathedral for a primitive cult of the dead. Though no tombs or graves have ever been found at the site, Schmidt believed that they remained to be discovered, hidden in niches located behind the temple walls. It's important to note that the vast majority of Gebekli Tepe is yet to be unearthed and mainstream archaeology has primarily ignored this site. For all intents and purposes, it may be one of the most important ancient structures of our species. As Ian Hodder of Stanford University says, Gebekli Tepe changes everything. And finally, our number one spot, the Sphinx. And bear with me because there is one ancient structure that is beyond baffling, the Sphinx and the perpetual mystery that surrounds it. Now I'm a stickler for science but there is something about the Great Sphinx of Giza that just doesn't add up. Now hear me out because the vast majority of Egyptologists claim that the Sphinx is 4,512 years old which would have meant it was built in the year 2,494 BC but that completely ignores the fact that there are certain very clear weathering patterns on the Sphinx that do not occur in any other ancient structures in the area, the Great Pyramids included. Author John Anthony West alongside geologist Robert M. Shoke found very clear evidence of water erosion on the structure which is not consistent of the environmental climate patterns of the given time. These patterns and the effect of water erosion would be consistent in a time when Egypt was a wet and rainy landscape, meaning that the Sphinx would have had to be between 7,000 and 10,000 years old. On another note, between 1991 and 1993 when West's team were examining the Sphinx, they found evidence of hollow, regularly shaped spaces and chambers between the pores and at either side of the structure. Egyptologists completely put an end to their examination and forbid any other work. The mysteries of the Sphinx are countless and one thing is for certain, they're not being fully explored by modern research. Well, what do you guys think about the mystery of the Sphinx? Let us know in the comment box down below. I know you will. Starting off in our number five spot, seven. Between 1975 and 1989, there were a total of seven unsolved murders in the Saga Prefecture. All of these cases were believed to be connected as the victims were all killed in the same way. They were all strangled to death, they were all females, and six of the seven victims went missing on a Wednesday. The only thing that was different about them was the age range, which was between 11 to 50 years old. There was only ever one man who was arrested and tried for these murders, but he was later found innocent, which leaves all of these murders officially unsolved. On top of that, the statute of limitations has expired for all of the victims except for the final three. And at number four, the Kumatori chain. In 1992, between the months of June and July, five members of a motorcycle game committed suicide within 0.7 miles of each other in Osaka. Packed suicides aren't exactly uncommon, but after examining the bodies, the police were convinced that this was staged to look like a packed suicide and that foul play was involved. Three of the victims in particular gave them reasons to believe these deaths were against their will. For example, one of the young men had horizontal rope marks around his neck, whereas if this was a suicide, there would have been diagonal marks. Next, one of the girls was found with stab wounds on her neck and chest. And for the third victim, he was found hanging from a chestnut tree, but police say there was no clear indication on how he climbed the tree prior to his death. It was then brought up that several of these young gang members reported being stalked at some point before the suicide, but no one was ever interviewed. In the number three spot, we have the Easter Island statues. Now this story starts on Easter day back in 1722, when a Dutch explorer decided discovered the island in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. There were in fact primitive people living on this island known as the Rapa Nui, but what was even more mind boggling was that their ancestors managed to carve and transport 887 statues to the coastline of the island. Some measure 33 feet tall and weigh up to 82 tons. Attempts have been made to recreate the methods that would have been available by these primitive people to make it all happen. 
but no one seems to be able to figure it out. So how the hell did they do it? In the number 2 spot we have UFOs and Area 51. The first unidentified flying object was reportedly sighted in 1878 in Texas when a farmer said he saw a large dark and circular flying object moving at a great speed. Another famous early sighting was in the UK in 1916 when a pilot reported seeing a row of lights that rose and disappeared into the sky. Now UFOs have become something of pop culture but every time we hear another story it brings up questions about the mysterious Air Force Base Area 51 and the secrets that lay there. Now the American government has kept quiet. What we do know is that they conduct secret black budget experiments and test similar aircrafts but also they have their hands in surveillance experiments and stuff like that. Now if you want to know more about Area 51 you're in luck because I made a top 5 on the crazy things going on there. It's on this channel be sure to check it out. And I went into way more detail than I did right now. In the number one spot, we have the Pyramids of Egypt. Designated as one of the greatest wonders of the ancient world, we still don't know how the Egyptians actually built these wonderful structures, especially the giant pyramid of Cheops which was put together 5,000 years ago. Can you believe that? The Great Pyramid is the size of a 40 floor building and engulfs an area large enough to fit 10 football fields. More than 2 million stone blocks were used to make the pyramid, each weighing between 2 and 5 tons. These were cut from a distant limestone quarry, which was a far trek away across the Nile. People have tried to do the math, like how long and how many people would it take to do something like this. The results were staggering. We're talking 400,000 workers and 20 years. That or they got a little help from the green men upstairs. They're still trying to figure it all out. And apparently, human people, yeah, with their tools, well, it just didn't make any sense. And like where they're located on like the compass of the world, their location, mm, something else is going on. Starting off at our number 5 spot, Jack the Ripper. Over a century ago, London's most notorious serial killer roamed the East End. His main prey were prostitutes and he killed at least 5 women that we know of. This neighborhood set into panic as these bodies were found within a 3 month period of each other in 1888, all within a mile of each other. Newspapers listed these killings as barbaric and too horrible to even describe. But basically all of the victims had their throats slashed and most of them had their stomachs slit and organs ripped out before the body was dumped on the street. His motive is still unknown. The FBI took a special interest in this case in 1988. This was at the request of a movie production company. Even with everyone in law enforcement looking into the case, the police were never able to put a face to the killer. The FBI noted that had we had the current technologies we have today back then, then it would have been possible to catch this person. One really key fact about the killer is the notes he left behind. The National Archives obtained letters exchanged between different law enforcement bosses in 1888, when all of these murders first happened. The killer sent these letters to the London Metropolitan Police Service to taunt them, and suggested that more murders were coming. Over the years many people have speculated the identity of Jack the Ripper, but no one has ever been prosecuted. So it looks like he took the secret to his grave. This makes him one of England's most famous unsolved mysteries, and one of the world's most infamous criminals. There was only one person that ever came close to naming this culprit, and that was author Russell Edwards, who in 2014 claimed that he could prove the identity of Jack the Ripper based on DNA from a shawl that belonged to one of the female victims. The DNA points to Aaron Kosminski, who was a Polish immigrant and actually one of the prime suspects of the gruesome murders, but again to this day nothing has been verified. And at number 4, The Babysitter. This unidentified serial killer is known to have killed at least 4 children between 1976 and 1977 in Oakland County. Between 76 and 77, two boys and two girls went missing from their town and they were all found dead within 19 days after they were taken. It was said that all these kids were on their way to a specific location at the time of their kidnapping. One of the victims was a 12 year old girl who was apparently going to run away on her bike. Then one of the boys, Timothy King, who was 11, disappeared on his way home after going to the drugstore to buy candy. There is one really messed up thing that happened with the King case. Before he was found dead, his parents turned to the media. They expressed their hope for his return and promised when he got home he could have his favorite food, Kentucky Fried Chicken. A few days later, King's body was found in a ditch. The coroner did an autopsy and found that the young boy had eaten KFC before he was strangled to death. So that means the killer must have seen his parents plea for their son's safe return. All four bodies were disposed of in a similar way, as they were all very public so the townspeople could see. The killer strangled and shot the kids and even sexually assaulted some of them before killing them. A task force was put together to find the killer, and there were several suspects, but none of them stuck. And at number 3, Yuki 
Yonishi. Yuki was a five-year-old girl who disappeared during a celebration of Greenery Day on April 29, 2005. To celebrate this Japanese holiday, she and her family, along with about 60 other people, went to a bamboo shoot digging event. Yuki was digging up bamboo shoots with some of the other kids and went to show her mother the first one she found. And then she wandered off back into the forest to find some more. After 20 or so minutes passed, her mother realized that she was not with the other kids. Her mother got the other adults to help her look for her daughter. A few minutes later, after they couldn't find her, they called the police, who also contacted the fire department for extra assistance. They even brought a police dog to try and track her scent. The dog reached a spot in the nearby forest and then stopped. Four other dogs were brought in and all of them led the search party to the exact same spot. It's as though she just vanished. On top of the dogs and the police department, 3,000 people helped search for her, but there were no clues to go off of. There were no clothing shards, no blood, there weren't even any footprints to go off of. Still to this day, no trace of Yuki has been found. Coming in at number two, Inokashira Park. Back in 1994, on April 23rd, a garbage bag was found by a cleaning staff member of Tokyo's Inokashira Park. The staff member noticed a horrible smell coming from the bag. She assumed it was raw fish. But when her colleague went to open the bag, she glanced inside and saw a human ankle. But that wasn't all. Along with the ankle, there were 24 pieces of human flesh, including two hands, two feet, and a shoulder. To make this case even weirder, if that's even possible, all of the parts were completely drained of blood. And each piece of flesh was cut out at exactly 20 centimeters. The police were called in, an autopsy was performed, however the cause of death was deemed unknown. Also a third of the body, including her head, were never found. Three days after the body parts were discovered, they were identified as belonging to 35-year-old architect named Sichi Kawamura. He was last seen on April 21st, so two days before the body parts were discovered, and lived five minutes from the park. The police were determined to find this man's killer. They even questioned thousands of people. During these interviews, they found out that one witness saw two suspicious men walking in the park carrying a plastic bag around 4 a.m on the day the body was found. Police assume that he was struck by a car and that the killers cut him up to get rid of the body. But that's just speculation, and to this day, this case remains unsolved. And in at number one, Baby on Board. This is a really messed up and disgusting story. Back in 1988, on March 18th, a man returned home to his apartment in Nagoya. Oddly, when he got to his front door, he noticed it was unlocked and all the lights were off. Once inside, he changed his clothes and began to get ready for bed. It was then that he heard a baby crying. He followed the sound and came across the mutilated body of his 27-year-old pregnant wife with his now newborn son laying at her feet. His wife was bound and strangled to death. After she was dead, it was suspected that the killer then proceeded to cut her stomach open and deliver the baby. He even cut the umbilical cord. The infant somehow survived, but no one ever found out who committed this horrible crime. The police came to investigate, and they believed that the wife was caught off guard in her home after the intruder broke in through the front door. After a short struggle, the intruder wrapped an electrical cord around the woman's neck and suffocated her. He then cut a vertical 38 centimeter slit in her belly and removed the live baby. He cut the umbilical cord, took some money from the woman's purse, and then left. Her husband didn't return home until hours later. Upon inspection of her body, it was noticed that something had been crammed into the now empty cavity in her stomach. It turns out the intruder put a phone and car keys into the hole in the woman's stomach where the baby used to be. Coming in at our number five spot, MOM.AVI. Yeah, this one's just a whole lot of confusing. This video is a minute long and basically consists of someone wearing a mask and just creepily opening their mouth every now and then. It's shot in black and white and that's all there is to it. So who knows why it's out there, but yeah, Definitely scary. In at number four, Little Baby's Ice Cream. Yeah, I've talked about this video more than I'd like to admit. So this was shot for an ice cream commercial, but why someone will want to advertise their company with this is a mystery to me, so it belongs on this list. First things first, what is with the name? It just doesn't work. That was their first mistake. Their second mistake was making this terrifying ad. So you would assume this ad was meant to encourage people to buy this ice cream, but I'm going to go ahead and say that it did the exact opposite. In the video, we have someone covered in ice cream cream, staring wide-eyed into the camera. And then the person has this big ol' spoon that they start to eat the ice cream off of their head with. And the whole time, there's a narrator which just amplifies the creep factor. This is what I'm talking about. When you eat little baby's ice cream, you'll wink and nod and hug and high-five each other with great enthusiasm. At number three, D.B. Cooper. To this day, no one even knows this person's real name. But on November 24th of 1971, this name was all over America. This was the day a man referred to as D.B. Cooper hijacked Northwest Airlines Flight 305 and its 36 passengers. He had a briefcase with him and claimed there was a bomb inside. The plane made an emergency landing in Seattle and the pilot messaged the control tower saying, we will ask you to stay there until we get coordinated with our friend in the back. Once 200 
$100,000 and several parachutes were given to Cooper, he demanded that the plane then take back off and fly him to Mexico. The passengers were released at this time and it was just him and the flight crew. Before taking off he asked for the rear door to remain open and for the plane to fly low and slow. Cooper clearly knew what he was doing but by the time authorities figured it out, it was too late. As the plane was flying to Reno, Cooper jumped out of the plane and parachuted into the night. Law enforcement officials did have five different planes tailing the jetliner, but apparently no one in those planes witnessed the jump. Also, the FBI are positive that Cooper wouldn't have survived this jump. But extensive searches on the ground in the landing area showed no signs of Cooper. The parachute or the money. Hundreds of people were interviewed, the FBI tracked leads across the nation, and the aircraft was scoured for evidence. But it was no use. D.B. Cooper was gone, making this one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in FBI history. However, in late January 2018, a startling claim was made to the media that D.B. Cooper was actually a former CIA operative named Robert Rackstraw. And he just so happens to be alive and well living in Southern California. But he has yet to be charged with anything. Coming in at number 2, Jean Benet Ramsey. Jean Benet Ramsey was a 6 year old beauty queen who was murdered in her home on December 26, 1996. Her murder, which is still unsolved, is one of the decade's most famous police investigations. The morning after Christmas Day, December 26, John Bonet's mother Patsy called the police after she found a three page ransom letter demanding $118,000 for their daughter's safe return. However, shortly after, Jean Bonet's father went down to the basement and found his daughter's lifeless body. Her skull was fractured and she had been sexually assaulted. Her official cause of death was asphyxia by strangulation. Her death was classified as a homicide. When the police department arrived to the crime scene, many errors were made that compromised the investigation. One major mistake being them allowing the father, John Ramsey, to move her body. Also the fact that they didn't separate the parents during questioning. Over the years to follow, the Ramseys themselves became prime suspects. People were saying perhaps they accidentally killed their daughter and they were trying to cover it up. Some of the clues showing that it could have been them was their inconsistent stories, John picking up the body, the ransom note was discovered to be written on paper found in their house, their suspicious media appearances, and a fiber retrieved from the duct tape that bound John Bonet's body matched the same fiber on Patsy's clothes. Yeah, lots of things. Other suspects included her brother, a convicted child predator, Editor, a housekeeper, the electrician, and even the town Santa. In the past years, countless books, documentaries, and true crime shows have featured their own theories about Jean Bonnet's murder. She has been gone for over two decades now, and no one has ever been charged with her murder, and the investigation still remains open to this day. Alright, and before we jump into number one, I just want to remind you guys to please show us some love by giving this video a big thumbs up and subscribing to our channel. And once again, stay tuned until the end of the video as I will be answering your questions and reading comments. And if you would like to be featured, in an upcoming video, then make sure you leave your questions down below. And in at number one, the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer committed a total of five confirmed murders, but has presumably killed an additional 20 to 28 people and seriously wounded two others. These murders took place between the late 1960s and the early 1970s in the San Francisco Bay Area. And since he's on the list, obviously his identity is still unknown to this day. Once the murders started taking place, the killer began taunting the police and the San Francisco Chronicle, which was the local paper. Over the years, he would send them a total of four letters, all containing encrypted messages. And out of these four letters, only one has ever been deciphered. Now while these letters were taunting, they did contain a number of leads. In fact, for a while, a man named Arthur Lee Allen was the name on the top of the suspect list. However, handwriting experts were unable to match his handwriting to the cipher or the various letters. On top of that, his fingerprints never tied him to the scene. Over the years, people have come forward claiming to know the killer's true identity, but so far nothing has been proven through the court. Coming in our number five spot, NASA hack. Back in 2002, a man named Gary McKinnon was doing some research on the existence of aliens. You know, as one does. But McKinnon took things a little too far when he decided to hack into NASA to try to look up the information that they had on this subject. Because as we all know, there's so many theories that NASA knows aliens exist, but they're trying to convince people that that's not the case. Yeah, so many conspiracy theories. When trying to get into the computer, McKinnon found a remote desktop connection that had no password protecting it. So obviously he did a little digging. There he found an image of some sort of flying aircraft, but it didn't look like any aircraft he had ever seen before. When the NASA employees noticed what he saw, his access was cut off. So yeah, pretty obvious that NASA didn't want whatever he saw to be seen by the public. Authorities apparently wanted to throw him in jail, claiming that he destroyed government computers and caused a lot of damage. But apparently these accusations were never proven and McKinnon was allowed to go free. And at number 4, Web Driver Torso. This YouTube page hit the internet in September of 2013. On this account, a video was uploaded every minute of every day and they would last exactly 11 seconds each. Then 
and towards the end there were a few that lasted 25 minutes. The videos would be filled with red and blue rectangles and a strange beeping sound. Originally people had no clue what these videos meant or why so many of them were being posted. One conspiracy theorist linked them to number stations, used during the cold war for communicating with spies. But then in 2014 Google revealed that this was actually a quality test account. But many people aren't buying this. For one thing it took them a whole year to say this. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that one. Also many people are saying that these videos must serve a darker purpose. At number 3, Max Headroom. This video was actually a newscast hack that happened back in 1987 at a Chicago station during a news broadcast. For people watching at home, what happened was the screen turned black for about 15 seconds. Then a person appeared on the screen wearing a Max Headroom mask. They were sitting in front of a rotating piece of metal and there was this humming noise. After about 30 seconds, the technicians at the stations were able to stop the pirated broadcast. In that same night, a fellow station, WTTW, were also hacked by the same guys. This time the hackers were on for 90 seconds. In this broadcast, the hackers were referencing advertising slogans, and the man in the mask pulled down his pants and was spanked by another person who was wearing a French maid's outfit. As they yelled, they are coming to get me. Yeah, no clue what the point of any of this was. Unfortunately, the stations were unable to trace the signal, and the identity of the hackers remain a mystery to this day. But people are certain that the person who did this was someone in the Chicago broadcasting community because the technologies required to pull off a huge hack like this wasn't available to average consumer at the time. And at number 2, Catacombs of Paris. Yeah, this is one terrifying place. I know it's a tourist spot, but I don't know if I'd actually go into it if I had the chance. I mean, it's freaky. And learning about the story definitely doesn't help. The catacombs are located beneath the streets of France and they are made up of millions of human remains. For obvious reasons, many people have believed that the catacombs are cursed. Outside of visiting hours, entry is illegal and all entrances have been blocked off. In this video, we see a man who sneaks down into the catacombs and begins to look around. Now, I think it's important to point out that there are 400 miles of tunnels within the catacombs, and many of these passages lead to lower levels, so it's extremely easy to get lost. Throughout the video, we see human like symbols on the walls and a lot of bones. At one point in the video, the man starts to breathe heavily and pick up speed, as if he's running away from something. The camera then falls to the floor and you can hear a splash of water. The scariest part about all of this was that this man was never found. And at number 1, Elise Lamb. This is truly a terrifying story that took place in 2003 and is still unsolved to this day. Elise was staying in Hotel Cecile in LA. In this video we see her get into an elevator. The door doesn't seem to be closing and we see her peeking out and at one point she's almost hiding behind the door as if she's scared of someone seeing her. She then steps outside the elevator and appears to be talking to someone and then she moves out of frame and that's the last anyone saw of her. A few weeks later she was found naked in the hotel's water tank after a handyman went to check on the tank after guests were complaining that the water tasted funny. Toxicology reports were done and revealed that there was nothing in her system at the time of her death. There was also no evidence of trauma to her body, so how she died is still a mystery to this day. Coming in at number 5 we have the narwhal tusk. If any of you have ever seen the movie Elf then you are familiar with the cute narwhal in the beginning of the movie, and that movie really brought narwhals to the public's attention and making this sea creature more popular than ever before, but so much about this creature is a mystery. In 1577, the English explorer Martin Frobisher led an expedition of 150 men to the northern Canada in search of gold, but they had come across something they had never intended, and that was the sea unicorn. The myth of the unicorn goes back centuries, and the business of unicorn horn trade was sustained through the Middle Ages and Renaissance by Vikings who killed the so called sea unicorns, cut off their horns, and sold them for an astronomical price. As European naturalists became more familiar with the world's animal, the myth of the unicorn faded, the mystery of the sea unicorn continued. Frobisher's discovery was actually what we know today as the narwhal, but the horn itself continues to be speculated by many. But the horn is apparently not a horn at all, but is a tooth. The relatives of narwhals include species like the beluga whales, orcas and dolphins, but the mystery remains of how did this massive freakish tooth evolve in this one specific species, after its ancestors branched off from whales with ordinary teeth. Many scientists and researchers debate about about what this tooth is used for, and some suggest it's an acoustic probe, a rudder, an ice picker, or a spear for battling predators. These creatures don't make it easy for researchers to see them use their tusk for anything at all, so it makes many people continue to question it. Many have come up with many different theories about this so called horn and what they use it for, and why they have it. It has created a huge debate between researchers and scientists to this day, but no definite answer has come out to this day. In at number 4, we have the submarine disappearances in 1968. This is one giant mysterious situation which is the disappearance of four 
submarines from four different countries in 1968. The USS Scorpion, a Soviet submarine K-129, a French submarine Minerve and the INS Daka went inexplicably missing over just a 5 month period, and the last two disappearing only 4 days apart. The exact causes of these sinkings remain unknown and remain a mystery over 50 years later. The INS Daka was scheduled to arrive in Israel on January 29, 1968. When it didn't return, searchers went out to find it, but after a while there was no sign of the missing submarine. So the search ended on February 4th, and the 69 man crew was officially declared dead in 1981. The cause of the sinking was never determined, and theories say that either a mechanical or human error caused a catastrophic accident, or that the submarine snorkel was damaged after hitting another ship, causing it to flood. The Minerve was on the training operation in the Mediterranean on January 27, 1968, and when they were on their way home, the men were caught in a bad storm. When it was 30 miles away from the port, the Minerve made contact with the men on land and said it would port in about an hour, but an hour came and went, and the submarine had never returned. A frantic search was conducted with 20 vessels and aircrafts trying to locate the Minerve, but it was eventually called off on February 2nd when they found nothing. The K-129 with a crew of 98 descended on March 8, 1968, and almost two weeks into patrol on the North Pacific, the K-129 failed to send a scheduled radio message. The Soviets soon began a frantic search, and after two months of no sign of the submarine, they gave up their search. The cause of the ship sinking remains unknown and will likely never be known. Almost three months after the K-129, the USS Scorpion, a nuclear-powered attack submarine with a crew of 99 men went missing in the Atlantic, while on its way back from a patrol in the Mediterranean. It was sent out on February 15, 1968, and toward the end of its patrol, it radioed that it was expected to return on May 27, but as you can guess, the USS Scorpion would never return. Like the others, many searched for the lost ship, but on June 5, the Scorpion and its crew were declared presumed lost. Over the years, there have been multiple searches for these submarines, but only parts have been recovered, and it's considered one of the biggest mysteries that happened in the sea. No one knows why so many went missing in such a short amount of time, how exactly they went missing for so long, and what exactly made these vessels disappear. And this is a mystery we may never get the answer to. Next up, at number three, the Golan structure. All right, guys, if Cat should be had you scratching your head, then the Golan structure is going to require some form of head scratching machinery. Let me introduce you to the Golan structure, also known as Rajum El Hiri, an ancient megalithic monument that resides in the Israeli occupied portion of Golan Heights, just off of the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. Made up of more than 42,000 basalt rocks arranged in concentric circles, with a mound that is 15 foot tall at its center, the Golan structure has often been referred to as the Stonehenge of the Levant. Why? Well, of course, because it dates back to at least the early Bronze Age to between 3000 and 2700 BCE. So, what is it? Who built it? What purpose did it serve? Yeah, that'll be a we don't have a freaking clue on pretty much all of those points. The outermost wall of this structure is 520 feet in diameter and 8 feet high, and since archaeological excavations have thus far yielded very few material remains, most Israeli archaeologists believe that this site was certainly not of a defensive position or a residential quarter, but most likely, as the vast majority of these enigmas are, it was a ritual centre. And not only that, but a ritual centre that is possibly linked to the cult of the dead. But on that note, there's even more of a mystery, because so far, no human remains have ever been found at the site, only objects pointing to its function as some kind of tomb. And also, hold on to your hats guys, because this is where it gets weirder, at the center of the Golan structure, the actual entrance to a tomb was discovered, one that during the June and December solstices, its axis is perfectly aligned with. Yeah. More questions, fewer answers. The thing is though, as its namesake is the Stonehenge of the Levant, no other structures of its kind have ever been discovered, which is even more of a head scratcher considering the fact that in ancient Britain, as well as in South America, structures like this are pretty common. Some believe that its purpose was to worship Tammuz and Ishtar, the ancient Mesopotamian fertility gods. Others suggest that it was used by the Dakmas of the Zoroastrians to lay out their dead and let the birds remove the flesh from their bones. Some say that it was a calendar or a site to observe the constellations for religious calculations. Maybe it was all of these things at some point in time, but as it remains, we may never know. Coming in at number two, the Great Lakes Copper Mystery. Oh boy, here we go. 
If you're not already feeling perplexed at the mysteries of the ancient world, then I'm fairly certain that this one will knock your metaphorical socks off. In the wilds of Michigan's Isle Royal National Park, it remains a beautiful and remote location, but thousands of years ago, the island was home to a thriving mining industry. Yes, mining. The rich veins of copper that ripple through the site's bedrock certainly drew the attention of the early Native Americans, and the fact that they diligently used this ore to make tools and jewellery is evident still. But the actual extent of their operation remains a complete and utter mystery. Why? Well, because around six and a half thousand years ago, there is clear and startling evidence to suggest that roughly 500,000 tonnes of copper was mined from the land. 500,000 tonnes of copper, which simply put is a staggering amount. Now, the copper culture complex is an astounding feat of ancient civilization regardless, but here is where our mystery takes another turn. You know why? Because Michigan copper is some of the purest copper on the planet. Keep that thought in mind. And 500,000 tons of it, well frankly put, there should be more evidence to its use throughout the Midwest. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a leap here, and I'm going to point us toward another ancient mystery, one that occurred off the coast of Turkey, roughly around the 14th century BC. A shipwreck that was discovered just off the east shore of Uluburun, discovered by a sponge diver back in 1982. Now, the Uluburun shipwreck is a bit of a mystery in and of itself, but it's with the content of its cargo that we're concerned with here. Within the hull of the shipwreck, over 10 tons of copper oxide ingots were discovered. Now, oxide ingots, which are named so down to the fact that they are shaped with rectangular handholds on either side, were relatively common in the late Bronze Age period of the Mediterranean Sea. You know what is weird? Testing on these ingots later discovered that they were extraordinarily pure for others of its kind. In fact, more than 99.5% pure. The oxides themselves were brittle blister copper, with voids and slag bits that only occur when multiple pourings were made outdoors over wood fires. There is only one type of ore of this purity, Michigan copper, the kind mined over six and a half thousand years ago in the copper culture complex of North America. Yeah, beats me guys. And finally coming in at number one spot, the Ness of Brodgar. And I absolutely adore this particular Neolithic mystery, and at the moment this is pretty much my direct inspiration for scholarly study of the ancient world. Now we've covered this area quite a few times on this channel, and if you'd like to find out more about places like Skara Bray, the ancient site discovered on the Orkney Isles of Northern Scotland, then please check out our Scottish history list, and also, you know, do your own discovering, because Neolithic Orkney is absolutely amazing. But there's another place that is even more remarkable than Skara Bray, the Ness of Brodgar, perhaps one of the most important discoveries in archaeological record depicting just what the hell was going on during the Neolithic period of ancient Britain. Now back in 2003, in a site that occupies the central position with the Orkney Archipelago that lies between the locks of Stenness and Haray, an imposing complex of monuments were discovered, a series of structures that seemingly were of pivotal importance to Neolithic Orcadians, and perhaps even further afield, perhaps even the whole of ancient Britain. The site itself, which lies between the already discovered Ring of Brodgar, a Neolithic stone circle that has its own mysteries, as well as the equally mysterious stones of Stenness, dates back to at least 3300 BC. As of 2016, 14 structures have been discovered, with many of them being built on top of each other, suggesting perhaps an even older use of this site, and a location of incredible importance to the Neolithic people of ancient Britain. Without a doubt though, the most impressive structure known as Structure 10, which appears to be a Neolithic pyramid, is even more of a head scratcher. Yeah, I just said Neolithic pyramid. Around this site, which was used prolifically up until around 2200 BCE, after which it abruptly stopped, archaeologists have since discovered the bones of approximately 400 cattle, around, wi around which the carcasses of several red deer were placed, with many of their tibia bones being cracked and extracted for marrow, suggesting the site of a feast. Do you know what's weirder though? During this event, there is also evidence of the temple being largely destroyed, brick by brick. Seemingly, for some reason, the Neolithic Orcadians built this site as a place of incredible importance, used it for a thousand years, and then one day, threw a party and tore the whole thing down. I have no idea, guys, but most importantly, I want to know. In fifth place is the youngest person on our list. To avoid getting dinged, I'll just say her age was in the lower single digits. Madeline was on a vacation in Portugal from the UK in May of 2007 with her parents Kate and Gary McCann, 
her even younger twin siblings, and a group of family friends. The McCann offspring had been left asleep at 8.30 in the ground floor apartment while their parents dined with friends in a restaurant less than 200 feet away. The parents checked on the children throughout the evening until Kate discovered Madeline was missing around 10 p.m. Over the following weeks, particularly after misinterpreting a British DNA analysis, the Portuguese police came to believe that Madeline had passed an accident in the apartment and her parents had covered it up. The Bacans were given suspect status in September, which was lifted when the Portugal's Attorney General archived the case in July of 2008 due to a lack of evidence. Madeline's parents continued the investigation using private detectives until Scotland Yard opened its own inquiry, titled Operation Grange in 2011. The senior investigating officer announced that he was treating the disappearance as a criminal act by a stranger, most likely a planned abduction or burglary gone wrong. In 2013, Scotland Yard released images of men they wanted to trace, including one of a man seen carrying a child towards the beach on the night that Madeline vanished. Shortly after this, and rather conveniently, Portuguese police reopened their inquiry. Operation Grange was scaled back in 2015, but the remaining detectives continue to pursue a small number of inquiries described as significant. As of the time of filming this video, there has been no clear answer as to what happened that night or who took Madeline. Many theories have emerged, including the possibility that Madeline left the apartment by herself and was abducted by a passerby or fell into one of the open construction sites nearby. But according to her mother, Madeline would have had to open the unlocked patio doors, close the curtains behind her, close the door again, open and close the child gate at the top of the stairs, then open and close the gate leading to the street, which was unlikely with her capabilities at the time. Heck, even I'm exhausted thinking about that. My own two cents on this involve wondering, A, why the patio doors would be unlocked, and why only Madeline went missing and not all three offspring. Ding, suspicious all around if you ask me. And since you're here, I'm assuming you're asking me. In fourth place, we have Cameron Remmer. On September 29th of 2011, 29-year-old Cameron left his home in Encinitas, California for a business trip to San Francisco and checked into the Fairmount Hotel with plans to remain in the city for about a month in hopes of expanding his medical marijuana business. On the evening of October 6th, one of Cameron's friends in Arizona received a strange phone call from him asking for money to pay for a room. When the friend agreed to the request, Cameron suddenly changed his mind and said he found a place to stay. It turned out that Cameron was drinking very heavily at the Fairmont that night and the hotel had uh, asked him to leave. Before he left, Cameron checked his bags in with the hotel and claimed he would return to pick them up later. He stayed true to his word, returning three days later, incoherent and disoriented, wearing a completely different shoe on each foot. He was able to get into his warmer room without retrieving his bags, and this was the last anyone saw of him. After Cameron was reported missing, his bags were finally opened to reveal over 60 vials of uh, medical something something, along with $30,000 in cash. There have since been numerous unconfirmed sightings of a disheveled Cameron wandering around San Francisco, leading to speculation that he suffered a psychotic break and is now a homeless transient. But I wonder, could his disappearance be connected to the large quantity of something something and the cash he had with them? Until he's found, we shall never know. Coming in at number three, we have the Bermuda Triangle. Named for the triangular shape of around 500,000 square miles of ocean between Miami, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico, for centuries the Bermuda Triangle has been mystified as a harrowing patch of ocean where sailors and pilots are prone to lose contact with the natural world and disappear forever. Back when Christopher Columbus first sailed the area, he claimed to see a giant ball of light in the sky that crashed into the horizon and made it glow. Soon after, all sorts of strange events happened in the area, including several boats mysteriously disappearing appearing, and in one instant in 1945, an entire squadron of US torpedo bombers vanished into thin air due to all these weird instances, giving this place the name the Devil's Triangle. The exact number of ships and airplanes that have disappeared is not known, but it's estimated that around 50 ships and 20 planes have been victim to the Bermuda Triangle, and many of these mysterious disappearances of these ships and planes have never been recovered. Many see the Bermuda Triangle as a real phenomenon, and have multiple theories to try and explain this mysterious place. And some of these theories are human error, paranormal explanations, violent weather like hurricanes, the Gulf Stream, which is a major surface current within the ocean, methane hydrates, which is a form of natural gas that causes bubbles to form around the ship and ultimately sink it without warning. All of these are only theories, and the Bermuda Triangle to this day is the most notorious sea legend of all time. In at number two, we have the Gulf of Mexico's cursed shipwreck. 
An estimated 4,000 shipwrecks litter the seabed across the stretch of water, and the Gulf of Mexico is one of the wealthiest locations for maritime archaeology in the world. In February 2001, oil workers for ExxonMobil were laying some pipeline when they happened to stumble upon a shipwreck about 2,600 feet deep. After discovering the wreckage, a team was assembled to explore this mysterious ship, but nothing seemed to go right. The exploration submarine malfunctioned right as it was getting ready to go down to check out the wreck, and that was only the beginning of these mysterious mysterious malfunctions. Others include video monitors going out whenever they fired their thrusters, sonars breaking and hydraulics going haywire with no explanation for any of these problems. After nothing working and things continuing to break, the Navy sent a researcher submarine down to investigate the wreckage, and on the way down it suddenly self-destructed, and somehow when it finally did get to the wreck, its arms were too short to reach anything. Six months later in July in 2002, a team working aboard the NR1 decided to launch a robotic sub down to the wreck site, but the malfunctions continued. The second the rover entered the water, it veered to the right and went out of control. The tether had caught in the propellers, which caused the vessel to smash into the underside of the ship, and the rover was never recovered. Later in the summer of 2002, the curse would continue as a ship from Sustainable Sea Program of the NOAA offered to pick up artifacts from the site. The first time the vessel attempted to leave the dock, debris was lodged in the propeller. The second time the propeller locked and the ship ended up in dry lock, needing repairs. Over the years, many others have tried to learn more about this wreck, but little was found, and what was found wasn't at all helpful. To this day, nothing has been able to get too close to the shipwreck to investigate and explore the phenomenon, and very little is known about this mysterious ship. Many believe the lives lost in the wreck continue to haunt the ship and will keep anyone and everything out of it at all costs. And finally, in at number one, we have the unmapped ocean floor. This is truly one of the biggest mysteries, and humans' curiosity about the Earth's floor is centuries old. Much remains to be learned about the ocean, especially exploring the mystery of the deep sea. From mapping and describing the physical, biological, geological, chemical, and archaeological aspects of the ocean and understanding their dynamics. For centuries, scholars believed the deep sea to be a lifeless place until the late 19th century. We've discovered there is a diversity of life and creatures living down there. Many researchers and divers had tried to dive and take submarines down to explore more of this unknown place, but it's very hard due to the extremely cold temperatures, the darkness, and the literally bone-shattering pressure that's more than 1,000 times that at sea level. In 2019, a retired naval officer, Victor Vescovo, set a new record as one of the deepest dives to date, reaching almost 36,000 feet down in a submarine into the deepest place on Earth, the Marianas Trench. The ocean covers more than 70% of the planet's surface, driving weather, regulating temperature, and ultimately supporting all life's organisms. Throughout history, the ocean has been a vital source of sustenance, transport, commerce, growth, and inspiration. But to this day, more than 80% of the ocean remains unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored, and it's still unknown how deep the ocean really is. Given the high degree of difficulty and cost in exploring our ocean using underwater vehicles, researchers have relied heavily on technologies such as sonar to generate maps of the seafloor, but currently less than 10% of the global ocean is mapped using modern sonar technology, and only about 35% of the United States have been mapped using modern methods. As we go deeper into the ocean floor, it's too deep for this modern technology because it's too remote and dark for this type of visual mapping. So if you go swimming in the ocean, it's very unknown of what is swimming and living below you. But scientists and researchers continue to develop technologies to unlock the many secrets of the ocean. The NOAA is working to increase our understanding of the ocean realm. Kicking off at number 5. Stone Tongue. Which again is a pretty damn awesome name for a death metal band, right? But if you're a fan of this series, you'll already know that lists like these are literal golden skull mines for naming yourselves in all your death metal glory. So, metalheads that are looking for a band name, take note, please. And also, thank me later. Anyway, Stone Tongue. Let's first cast our gaze back to 1991 in Northamptonshire, Britain, where archaeologists discovered a gruesome and even stranger mutilation that emerged from the remains of Roman Britain. Now, it's no hidden secret that Britain is littered with instances of intrigue from the Roman occupation of Britain, but this one in particular seemingly doesn't fit any sort of logic or any of the many other mysteries of ancient Britain. At the bottom of a burial pit, buried beneath dozens of other bodies, archaeologists found the skeleton of a man whose tongue had apparently been amputated and instead replaced with a flat stone. 
wedged into his mouth. The burial site at Stanwyck near the River Neen dates back from between the 3rd or 4th centuries, where people in Roman Britain would have congregated in small farming communities. Now, it's certainly not rare to find makeshift burial pits in Roman Britain, in fact they are a dime a dozen, but the strange thing was, this guy was buried at the bottom, face down. And not only was he buried face down, which would usually indicate some sort of fear of him by the community, but his tongue was cut out and replaced with a stone. As researchers noted, this was something that just hasn't ever been identified as a practice so far in archaeological records. There are no other known occurrences of this ever happening in Roman Britain, so far anyway. And the fact that this was on top of the matter of him being buried face down, well, who the hell was he? What was he doing? It is believed that the man would have been in his 30s at the time of his death, and one theory is that he had mental health issues and was actually responsible for severing his own tongue. Perhaps the tongue was the community symbolically making him whole again, but then why was he buried face down? Now, archaeologists are currently trying to correlate this practice to ancient Germanic laws, but its place in a small farming community in Roman Britain, yeah, that remains a complete and utter mystery. Swinging in at number four, Kat Shabib. And I absolutely love this one, as well as pretty much all of the next few entries, because nothing gets my mind worrying quite like an ancient structure that no one knows what the hell it is, or what it was doing, or why it was even there. Let me introduce you to the Kat Shabib, an ancient wall in southern Jordan that since its identification by British diplomat Sir Alec Kirkbride back in 1948 has had archaeologists scratching their heads ever since. I say identification because Kirkbride certainly didn't discover this structure per se, but instead he noticed that whilst he was flying over Jordan there was a very apparent and very clear line across the geographical landscape. A wall, in fact, that ran 150 kilometers, making it the longest linear archaeological site in Jordan. Now, why would anyone build a wall of such length? Now, the Romans had reason to with the Picts, ancient China had reason to with Genghis Khan, but Kashabib? What's that all about? The thing is though, whilst the purpose of this wall is the frantic subject of debate, we do know who built it. The semi-nomadic Bedouin people led by the Arab prince Amir Shabib. Historically, there is a certain recognition of the Bedouin people using the wall, but there is still no concrete evidence to determine its purpose. Archaeologists during the 1940s and 1950s argued that the Kashabib was used for military and defence purposes. However, there is a clear problem with that assumption. This wall is far too low for it to have ever been a successful defensive mechanism. And although it is massive in length, at best estimates, it stood at around just a metre and a half high. What was it keeping out? Not a lot. So then, why have archaeologists also discovered over 100 ruined towers across its span? Yeah, more and more questions. Oh, and also, did I mention that best estimates point toward it being built in the Iron Age? Yeah. Catch your bib, everybody. A complete and utter mystery. In third place, time to visit the Cecil Hotel. Yes, I know, I've talked about this before, because it's truly, it's just got such a terrifyingly fascinating history. So many lives have met their end there, and it's actually undergone an attempted rebrand in recent years to try and change the reputation it holds with no luck. Canadian tourist Elisa Lam was enjoying a lovely vacation to Los Angeles in the beginning of 2013, having chosen to stay in the Cecil Hotel for its reasonable pricing while she took in the sights, including a trip to the San Diego Zoo and a taping of Conan all of which she documented on social media. Lisa was initially assigned a shared room on the hotel's fifth floor, but her roommates complained about odd behavior and she was moved to a room of her own after just two days. According to Amy Price, the manager of the Cecil Hotel, at the time of Lisa's disappearance, she was leaving notes for her roommates that said, go home and go away and would lock the door to the room and require a password for entry. Lisa contacted her parents in British Columbia daily while traveling up until the day she disappeared. On January 31st of 2013, the day she was scheduled to, you know, check out at the Cecil, her parents didn't hear from her and called the Los Angeles Police Department and made the decision to fly to LA themselves. Katie Orphan, manager of the last bookstore, was the only person who recalled seeing her that day, describing her as outgoing, lively, and very friendly while purchasing gifts to bring home to her family. Katie recalled a conversation they had shared about how heavy certain books would be to carry around for a day. Police searched the hotel to the extent that they legally could. They searched Elisa's room and had dogs go through the building, including the rooftop, but the dogs were unsuccessful in detecting her scent. Since the police didn't have probable cause, you know, that any sort of crime had been committed, they didn't search every room. On February 6th, a week after Elisa had last been seen, the LAPD finally decided more help was needed. 
Go figure. Flyers with her image were posted in the neighborhood and online. Interest in her disappearance increased on February 13th when the LAPD released security camera footage of her behaving erratically in a hotel elevator on the day she was last seen alive with the footage going viral. During this search, for our lovely missing girl, guests at the hotel began complaining about low water pressure, with some claiming their water was black in color and had an unusual taste. On the morning of February 19th, Santiago Lopez, a hotel maintenance worker, found her body in one of 4,000 gallon tanks located on the roof that provided water to guest rooms, a kitchen, and a coffee shop. Pardon me, I'm a little nauseous. Through the open hatch, he saw Elisa lying face up in the water. The tank was drained and cut open since its maintenance hatch was too small to accommodate equipment needed to remove the body, leading many people to wonder just how she got in there in the first place. Now, while I'm not gonna go into detail about what her body looked like, and I'm questioning why that information in such precision is easily found to public knowledge, there was no evidence of physical trauma, self-ending, intercourse, or force. Toxicology tests showed traces consistent with prescription medication found amongst her belongings, plus non-prescription drugs, you know, like ibuprofen. So normal stuff in her system. A very small quantity of alcohol was present, but no other recreational drugs. Yes, yes, I know, her body was eventually found, but she did vanish for long enough to have account for today's list. In second place, we have Jessica Kinsey. Being a young adult of school attending age, she lived with her family southwest of St. Louis in the close-knit community of Union. This tale begins on Boxing Day of 19. When she wanted to go to a friend's house to show off her new winter wear she had been gifted, and her parents, who worked from home, allowed her to head off. At 2 p.m., she called her mother, Mary Klein, to let her know that she was staying away for a few more hours, promising to call back around 5 if she was going to stay for supper. Jessica did not call home, and her family never saw her ever again. At 5.30 p.m., her mother, Mary, called the friend's mother, who told her that Jimmy Hopkins, age 23, picked up Jessica, and that Jessica had asked her to let Mary know, but the friend's mom had totally forgotten. Mary had known Jimmy since he was 11, when he moved to Union to live with his mother, and he was a close friend to the entire family. Mary called the Union Police Department to report her daughter missing when Jessica failed to return home because she didn't trust Jamie's intention with her daughter. So he might have been a close family friend, but like, it's the kind of close family friend that you just sort of keep at a distance. Mark Henderson told the police that Jimmy paid him to drive himself and Jessica to Cloverdale, Indiana, stating that Jessica was quiet in the car's back seat and kept her head down the entire trip. Jimmy had told Mark that the end goal for the trip was to go to Niagara Falls to get married, having shown Mark his grandmother's engagement ring as proof, saying they had to meet with a friend in Cloverdale who would help them the rest of the way. Once in Cloverdale, the trio checked into the Dollar Inn Motel with Jessica and Jimmy in room 222, while Mark stayed next door in room 224. Mark first said he heard a lot of banging noises coming from the room in the middle of the night that kind of sounded like a body hitting the wall. Out of concern, he went and knocked on the door and received no response for about five minutes. And then Jimmy hollered out that everything was fine, simply that he and Jessica were having rough intercourse. Mark later changed his story, saying that Jimmy came to the door fully dressed, but blocked his view of the room and would not let him inside. Which version do you believe? The most important thing, though, is that he never saw Jessica. When he went to retrieve the duo the following morning, they had disappeared, along with his car. Mark reported the vehicle stolen to the Cloverdale police, but they failed to enter the report into the National Crime Information Center database for over 30 days. On December 27th, Jimmy sold the wedding rings at a pawn shop in Paris, Tennessee, so 300 miles southwest of Cloverdale, and about a month after Jessica's disappearance, Mark's vehicle turned up across the country in Compton, California, after Cloverdale police had finally entered the car into the NCIC. An unidentified black male dropped the car off at a garage on January 6th of 1996. We don't know anything more about him. The following spring, police learned that another acquaintance of Jimmy's said he had seen him with a girl matching Jessica's description, with the investigators discovering that he worked at a yogurt shop in Los Angeles. The shop's owner confirmed to the police that a young girl had often visited the shop while Jimmy worked a shift. Jimmy returned to Missouri alone in June of 1996 and hooked up with his second wife, Anna. He refused to cooperate with the police investigating Jessica's disappearance. It wasn't until 2005 when police tried speaking to Jimmy, off the record, with the police chief afterwards claiming he was certain Jimmy had ended Jessica's life, but couldn't use anything he said in the session because officers had not read him as Miranda rights. Okay, my brain is boggled. Whatever was said between Jimmy and the police chief is still unknown. Police believe that someone else has vital information about Jessica's disappearance and have made public appeals over the years. However, no one's come forward. Oh, and before anyone wants to try to talk to Jimmy ever again, he took his own life in 2008, so he's not talking anymore. Not that he ever really was in the first place. In first place, we end our list with Claudia Kershock. 
In May of 2000, New York-based travel writers Claudia and Tanya were traveling to Havana, Cuba on a business trip, but found the trip suddenly canceled during their layover in Negril, Jamaica. Well disappointed, the duo were determined to make the most of it. At a resort in Negril, Claudia made friends with Anthony Grant, one of the resort's bartenders. She was a big fan of reggae music, and Anthony reportedly offered to take her to a nearby club. Now Tanya managed to book a flight home and agreed to meet up with Claudia when she got back to New York City. A lifeguard was reportedly the last person to see Claudia the next afternoon, when she was walking on a local beach far away from the resort. On June 2nd, Claudia's parents were notified that she hadn't shown up for work in New York and contacted the resort in Jamaica. By this point, hotel maids had reported Claudia missing after noticing she had not slept in her bed for several days, but all of her belongings were still in her room. Her passport, credit card, cell phone, and almost $200 in cash were recovered from the hotel safe right where she had left them. Claudia's mom, Mary, told the press that Claudia was a very organized person and would have brought her belongings with her had she planned any sort of excursion or variance in her trip. As soon as they found out their daughter was missing, Claudia's parents were on the next plane to Jamaica, but their attempts to find out what happened to their daughter hit one dead end after another, beginning at the resort where Claudia had been staying. As a security precaution, the license plates of all vehicles entering and leaving the resort should have been carefully recorded in a logbook. Conveniently, the logbook for the month that Claudia disappeared was missing. Then a videotape from a surveillance camera mounted near Claudia's room had been recorded over. Oh, finally, the room where Claudia stayed was cleared by housekeeping and hotel security before it could be processed for clues. Seems a little sus. Just a smidge. Now frustrated by the progress of the investigation, Claudia's parents brought in the FBI and an American surgeon rescue team. Rightfully so. According to a canine handler on the case, his dog tracked Claudia's scent to the home of Anthony Grant that bartender I mentioned a moment ago. At Anthony's home, the dog hit the scent on a pair of boots, a pair of gloves, a knife. Oh, and it found Claudia's scent in the trunk and backseat of Anthony's car. Anthony was investigated and polygraphed, but the results were inconclusive. The FBI stated that they interviewed Anthony for several weeks, but they don't consider him a suspect. Now, the parents have struggled to keep the search for Claudia alive, despite dwindling leads and diminishing support, and are still offering a $50,000 reward for answers. I hope they get some.